Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. Do we have a hot topic for you today? And it better be hot because we're enjoying a beautiful Hawaiian winter. It is noon in Honolulu and 72 degrees. I should have a jacket on right now, but I had to get dressed up for the show. So we do have a hot topic namely solar energy in all its glory. And we're gonna be talking about the fact that not only is solar, in this case, uh, PV, photovoltaic, big right now, but if I know anything about markets, it's just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. For one thing, Governor Ige declared, this was what, seven years ago that Hawaii would be 100% clean energy by the year 2045. And by George, we're not just on track, we're ahead of schedule. And thanks to people like my guests today, we're going to continue to be ahead of schedule. So please welcome Jeff Kemmerlin, the CEO of Sunspear Energy and one of the largest solar firms in town, which is saying something because we have one heck of a solar industry. So thank you so much for enlightening us today, Jeff. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Howard. Yeah, and you know, I want to ask a whole bunch of general questions. Okay, well, question number one, do you know of all the industries in Hawaii where solar ranks these days in, in terms of the dollar turnout? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't seen any figures specific to that um, recently. Um, I think it's going to be a very, you know, important industry uh, during the economic recovery process when we're so, um, you know, dependent on the service industry here in Hawaii. So mm -hmm. do you have figures specific to solar? Uh, no, it's just, I've seen reports, this was some years ago, that solar was the biggest construction of all the construction subsets in Hawaii, solar, solar was the biggest and employed, I believe it was not just hundreds of people, but thousands of people. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I think solar was instrumental during the last, you know, financial downturn after 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. um, that was definitely a boom period for the solar industry in Hawaii and, uh, you know, helped mitigate some of the uh, consequences of the financial crisis here. And I think we're gonna see something similar um, in this most, you know, recent economic downturn that we're seeing that's, mm -hmm. uh, I think, magnified in Hawaii just due to our dependence on tourism and, and the service yeah, industry, yeah. so. So as long yeah. as it's going strong, it's taking up a lot of that uh, economic slack though. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, we've been um, hiring for lots of new positions just in the last, you know, few months, last six months, and I think we're going to continue to do so. So I hope, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, there's there's more and more interest and more and more demand for solar over the next year and the following years um, that will allow companies like us to continue to grow and attract more smart and bright individuals into the industry. Speaking of which, uh, that leads to number one question. Do, do you have enough skilled labor in town or do the community colleges need to provide more training in, in any given related field? Yeah, I think, you know, trade schools and um, learning, you know, electrical, uh, you know, we work with hiring a lot of journeymen or apprentice uh, electricians is a big part of, uh, you know, the solar PV industry in particular having an electrical focus. Um, but yeah, I think it would be great for, you know, the community colleges and UH to focus more on STEM and, and renewable specific educational programs um, mm -hmm. so that we don't, you know, see the brain drain that you often see in Hawaii where uh, students go to school, graduate either here or, or go to school in the mainland and, and don't come back, you know? There. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and especially with so many young people laid off. They used to work in uh, Waikiki primarily, and they're just sitting around at home right now. They're young, they can get trained in a whole new skill. 
a possible growth industry for Hawaii and keep a lot of our young people here. So our slides are up. Eric, can you do slide number one, please? T tell us a little bit about uh, your, your firm here. Yeah, Sunspear, um, we, uh, we have a partner electrical contractor, uh, PLS Power, um, which was formed in 2014. Um, they were primarily doing non-solar electrical uh, related work. Um, Sunspear, um, myself and my co-founder, Peter Fletter, um, we worked at uh, Synetric, which was one of the larger solar companies um, during the earlier days of the solar industry from 2000. 2004 to 2016, um, and we left and, and formed our own business um, around 2016 after uh, our former company was acquired by a mainland solar firm. And uh, yeah, we focused on the CNI, the commercial industrial sector, the first few years. Um, the solar industry was kind of on a downturn at that time, and uh, we kind of just focused on public sector projects like the Department of Education projects in 2017. Um, and then we worked on the Honolulu Airport in 2018 and 19. And you mentioned the community colleges. Um, we did installations at the University of Hawaii Community College campuses um, in those years uh, to try and help the UH system uh, achieve a net zero, 100% renewable uh, target at that time. That's music to my ears. Why, why don't we bring yeah. up the, the next slide, get some uh, look at some projects here. Yeah, so um, yeah, I got a few a uh, few slides here, I think, in just chronological order of some of the projects that we worked on. Um, this is a picture, uh, aerial view of Lehoku Elementary School out on the west side of Oahu. Um, we installed in total over 700 kW of PV across several um, Department of Education uh, public school campuses. And we also installed uh, a little over uh, around 150 Tesla Powerwall 2 units. And that was, uh, that was an exciting project because those were the first generation Powerwall 2 batteries that were shipped to Hawaii. And they didn't really have a design for the, the microgrid application yet. Um, for that specific product. Um, and so we kind of worked with the uh, engineering team at Tesla to program a, a sort of custom design system where each uh, classroom or group of classrooms was, was essentially a microgrid and that powered the new air conditioning systems that they were adding uh, to those classrooms. Um, and that was a really good, feel good project just because, you know, the the classrooms were, were really hot and not really a suitable learning environment for, for the students and on some of those campuses, especially on the west side of the island. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a, a fun uh, summer when we were trying to, you know, get a lot of those projects built when the students were out of school. And you mentioned storage. I think that was one of the first big PV slash storage projects that went up in, in Hawaii? Because yeah, in the early I, days, it was just PV. And then we said, hey, wait a minute. If we want to deal with the uh, feed, the, the peak demand and the cloudy days and so forth, we need storage. Yeah, definitely. I think that was one of the first um, larger scale sort of behind the meter um, applic applications of energy storage. Um, here in Hawaii, uh, in the state as a whole. Um, hence the name of the company, Sunspear. We were, like try to be mm -hmm. at the, I guess, cutting edge of new technology mm -hmm. offerings. Um, sometimes at the bleeding edge, those, those yeah. projects can be a little uh, uh, challenging if there's not a uh, you know, tried and proven system in place um, on how to sort of aggregate a large scale battery system uh, at, at scale. Um, but yeah, that was, that was really exciting. And, um, you know, we learned after that was in the summer of 2017. Um, so Hurricane Maria had hit uh, Puerto Rico just a few months after we had completed that installation. And um, Peter and, you know, the Tesla engineering team kind of applied the design that was implemented for the DOE projects here to help respond to the, you know, the crisis in Puerto Rico at that time. 
Um, so it felt good to, you know, be the guinea pig um, on a new solution that was, you know, able to help respond to a crisis elsewhere. Beautiful. Yeah, that, that's a feel good story. And just for the uninitiated, can you briefly tell us why storage is so valuable? The middle of the day when it's nice and sunny versus the evening when peak demand and so forth. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, the sun's only out for a certain number of hours per day, right? Um, you know, most of the solar energy production happens between the hours of 9 and 10 a.m. and 3 and 4 p.m. Um, but people are using power 24 hours a day. Uh, and residential applications, they're especially using power when the sun's not out. You know, people go to work during the day, maybe not as much during COVID times, but, um, you know, generally, traditionally, people aren't home during the day. So, PV system on a on a residential home is producing power during the day, but the, the power use at home um, is, is minimal. Um, so we need a, a place to store that excess kilowatt hours and um, save it for later usage when they come home from work, cook dinner, uh, watch Netflix at night, et cetera. Um, so that's where battery storage comes in and allows flexibility for the power that's generated during those daytime hours to be dispatched at any point you know, point in time during the day. And then on, on a larger island-wide scale, you have all this beautiful sunshine in the middle of the day, but our peak demand, maybe it's, it's changed with, with COVID, but traditionally the peak demand for electricity has started right about 5 p.m. just when the sun is going down. And yeah. In comes your, your storage. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Traditionally, you know, we've worked on a lot of in the commercial industry where that has benefited from commercial businesses are opening open during the day. So their their usage kind of matches when the sun is out. Um, but especially for, you know, residential applications. And as we get more and more solar on the grid here in Hawaii, um, you know, which we're, we're getting to that point. Um, you know, with Hawaii, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, being ahead of uh, you know, the goals set in the renewable portfolio standard adoption um, that, yeah, we need, we need to add more distributed resources and, and means of storing excess energy that's produced during, during the daytime by PV. Mm -hmm. And do we have any, uh, Eric, any other slides to show, please? You see that, Jeff? Oh, yeah. So uh, in 2018 and 19, we completed a 5.3 megawatt uh, installation um, at the Honolulu airport. Um, worked with Johnson Controls, had a energy service performance contract um, to uh, do energy efficiency improvements um, with the Honolulu airport. Um, and part of that was solar. Um, and we worked with Johnson Controls and SunPower to complete that roughly 12,000 500 panel installation, um, uh, rooftops, carports. Um, if anybody flies Inner Island, um, we covered that top parking deck on the seventh floor at the Inner Island parking terminal. Um, so I know everybody used to kind of avoid the top level of the parking structure um, because their car would just bake in the sun. But yeah, now there's a nice roof over top of it that's shaded and keeps the car cool during the day. Um, yeah, fun fact about that is I think, uh, car accidents in that parking garage have, have gone down because people are spending less time circling around for looking for a parking space, uh, <laughs> trying to avoid the, the top floor. Mm -hmm. So an unintended, unknown positive side effect of, uh, yeah, of yeah. solar. An unintended benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, uh, is that the biggest PV installation in the state? 5.3 megs? Um, I think possibly in the, uh, like C&I, you know, commercial industrial uh, sector, there's, you know, utility scale solar projects and large open mm -hmm. spaces and open fields that are much larger than that. Um, but in terms of like behind the meter solar installations, um, yeah, I think it, 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 it might be the largest. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is the largest. Yeah, um, yeah. Ala Moana has a pretty big system, but I don't think it's, it's quite as, as big as, as the airport. 
Yeah, we've worked on some uh, utility scale projects uh, back at our, our former company, Synetric, Peter uh, worked on, it was a 5.9 megawatt solar farm in Kaliloa, um, part of the feed and tariff mm -hmm. program. Um, we built some of the legacy feed and tariff program projects that um, took a while to get installed um, in recent years. And uh, yeah, I think there'll be more of that in the future with the, the new community solar program that's uh, forthcoming. Um, but, you know, agricultural land in Hawaii is, is scarce. So, you know, we, uh, I, I think distributed, um, you know, distributed energy systems, whether it's residential rooftops, um, commercial, uh, you know, commercial businesses on the rooftops, and then also parking lots. I really think parking lots are, you know, we've, we've kind of become a leader in carport installations doing some pretty sizable um, carport projects uh, between the airport and the community college campuses. Um, so I think that'll, you know, continue to be a, a good use of of land and space for renewable energy generation. Yeah, there's been some controversy recently. I think it was out in the Wahiwa area where another utility farm was planned and the residents are saying, hey, that's good ag land. Why, why are we taking that over? Yeah, I think you, you need to strike a balance. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot, um, you know, you can do with the agricultural land space um, in terms of you know generating renewable power, carbon sequestration, um, growing uh, sustainable plant products. Um, yeah, so I think I think you know when when going that route, you need to take a more holistic approach and incorporate some of those elements um, rather than just strictly focusing on the uh, solar energy generation um, component Precisely, of, yeah. of land use. Yeah, that, uh, I think that makes sense to a whole lot of us because land is so scarce, especially here, here on Oahu. Make multiple, multiple uses out of them because you're creating some shade and there's a lot of plants that uh, love to grow in shade. Definitely, yeah. And then, then I saw an instance over on Kauai where it's just uh, weed type material growing, but periodically uh, a farmer with some goats gets to herd his goats in there and they get a, a free meal out of it and can control the undergrowth. And speaking of free, I keep reading on that on the mainland, the new solar installations are being installed for three cents, a KWH. And I don't think we can come anywhere near to that in, in Hawaii, I believe it's at least Six, seven cents a KWH? Uh, KWH in terms of like delivered cost of electricity. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of inputs and variables that, you know, go into that delivered um, cost of power. Uh, one that you just touched on is, is land scarcity. Um, you know, so for utility scale projects, the, the cost of land factors into the cost of the delivered price of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in Hawaii, as I think everybody that lives here knows, real estate costs are much higher. Um, so therefore, you know, land usage agreements are going to be more expensive. Um, that, you know, drives up the price of electricity or of generating renewable electricity if you're, you're tying up a significant chunk of land. Um, yeah, then other just factors, you know, Hawaii's cost of living premium that that uh, trickles down into the cost of renewable, you know, solar power generation. Our you know our, our wage rates might be higher um, than other markets. Um, you know, permitting. There's a lot of soft costs that I think are higher in the Hawaii market um, than that than they are in other markets. Um, permitting, soft costs. Um, uh yeah just you know ob the obvious one is, is shipping of materials um so your direct costs in addition your costs soft costs are going to be higher in hawaii relative uh to the mainland you know shipping freight shipping all the major components pv panels and the racking and mounting materials and everything that goes along with it um you have that shipping premium here so 
there's a variety of inputs that uh you know drive our our cost higher than um than other locations but we have seen them come down you know significantly over the years um and i think they'll continue to come down um both as the cost of those components reduce um you know which we've seen happen uh you know the cost of pv panels has dropped exponentially and um continues to to decline as as the uh as the industry scales um and you know we on on the installation side we get better every project that we do right so um rights law is uh as capacity uh doubles you have a percentage reduction in costs associated with that capacity and um you know that permeates both the manufacturing aspect of the business as well as as the installation um aspect of it so do you have a ballpark figure as to what a say a new solar farm or big uh, industrial installation would cost what it could uh, sell how much per kwh the it could sell to the utility yeah, I mean, I think some of the recent contracts um, for, you know, the big utility scale projects that were uh, being procured directly by the utility um, landed in the eight to eight to 10 cent range. Um, you know, those projects incorporate battery storage. So the way that the battery storage component is priced is sort of a uh, component that gets missed a lot of times. Um, mm -hmm. You know the news headlines kind of focus on the delivered cost of kwh but may um, fail to recognize some of the additional costs in delivered power um, for dispatching um, power that's stored in a in a battery um, at a later time of the day so um, there might be a capacity charge or things along those lines so it can get pretty complicated um, in terms of how those you know delivered cost of power is measured um, on some of those bigger bigger projects. And as as we know, oil fired electricity just ain't cheap, especially when the oil goes up above uh, sixty dollars a barrel. And as more and more solar displaces more and more oil, and the oil fired is a heck of a lot higher than the price you cited. Do you see maybe the cost of electricity coming down as we get more and more renewables on, on board? It's possible. Um, I think, uh, you know, we focus on the distributed space. So rooftop mm -hmm. solar, whether it's residential or uh, commercial industrial, um, I think it's going to be a necessary approach because that, um, you know, doing distributed renewable power kind of matches the power supply with the power usage at, you know, the local site. And I think most mm -hmm. events on the grid happen at a, at a local um, level. So um, I think, you know, distributed rooftop PV carports um, is going to be necessary to achieve, you know, mm -hmm. our, our renewable portfolio targets. Um, the centralized utility scale power plant um model while it's it's a piece of that pie um i think the distributed component is is actually more efficient um and will be more cost effective over the long run for the for the end consumer and we've got about one minute left what about in a <laughs> one sentence the smart grid which includes time of day pricing demand side management integration of electric vehicles all coming together. I mean, it's going to take some really smart people <laughs> to put all those pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're, like you said, ahead of our goals, but um, that's going to be an important part of integrating all these different technologies together to uh, achieve our goals over the long run. Um, but you know we're we're about 20 25 percent um, of the way there and uh, yeah we're looking forward to to continuing the the trend and transition to clean energy so 
we can go deeper in the weeds on, on the next episode on that, Howard. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Do you agree that uh, time of use pricing and demand side management eventually is going to be an integral component uh, with, with this? So people change their behavior to go, go yeah. with the solar cycle. Yeah, I think the behavioral component is is going to be uh, you know big, and I think the uh, you know the recent performance based um, rate program um, that was uh, is going to be integrated by the utility. I think will be a big part of uh, you know our adoption of uh, clean energy policy and, and getting the utility company on on board with all the initiatives that are being taken by the rest of the industry. Mm -hmm. And we've got to go, but just one last idea in terms of time of use pricing, people are out of their homes in the day, but how about timing their dishwasher, their clothes washer, their dryer to go on say at uh, 1030, 1130 and 1230, right in the peak solar times and take, making use when we get time of day of the, uh, the cheaper rates then. Yeah, absolutely. I think smart controls in homes are, are going to be uh, a key component of making the most efficient use of power that's produced by PV during the daytime and being able to uh, time those uh, circuits in, in homes and in businesses to control that remotely and smartly um, is, is going to be a, a, a key component of uh, just making the whole renewable energy production paradigm more efficient. And just to make things even more complicated, how about electric vehicles, EVs? We agree that if we're gonna have a zero emissions economy down the road, which we're shooting for, we're gonna to have to convert over to electric vehicles and integrate them into the grid. So I don't know how you PV makers can make all that electricity to supply all of that new demand there. And oh, and yeah. Then, potentially use the EV batteries with the agreement with the utility to feed into the grid at certain times. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, exciting potential around that new demand that's gonna be added to the grid for, for EV charging. Um, I think roughly about 27% of Hawaii's petroleum usage goes to ground transportation. Um, so to offset that by electrifying the vehicles here, um, in the state is going to require a significant amount of additional electricity generation to support that. Um, so I think, you know, PV is going to be a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we're, we're seeing more and more, especially doing a lot of these solar carport systems that we're installing EV charging stations um, as well. Where, where are the EV charging stations going up? Uh, just, you know, in new parking lots or, you know, existing parking lots where we're installing uh, solar carport canopies. Um, we've just seen an increased number of requests for it uh, by commercial businesses, um, homeowners adding it to their residential PV systems as, as sort of an add-on. Um, so I think we'll continue to see that. Beautiful. And I know we have to wrap up. So... You know, just based on what you said, I think you're in for a great, great, great uh, growing future. I think this is going to be one of the most important components of the Hawaii economy in, in the years to come. Because you're, you're yeah. going to be skilled. And if they're skilled, they're making a good wage. Yeah, we're excited. Like I said, you know, we're we're hiring a lot of new people and looking to hire more people. And uh, yeah, very optimistic about the outlook for the industry as a whole, and uh, you know, all the exciting opportunities that come along with that. So glad to be a part of uh, glad to be a part of our transition here to clean energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a, You've chosen a wonderful profession, Jeff. And on that very cheery note. We must bid fond to do. Thank you so much, Jeff Carolyn, CEO of Sun Spear Energy. And see you next time, audience. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Howard.